Hi gang. I've got my tea today and my tinfoil hat. If this is your first time here, hi, I'm Tamson. I love all things history, mystery, conspiracy, and paranormal. I love to do deep dives on topics that I often stumble upon surely by chance and I love telling stories. So welcome to Sit and Spin. Today we're going to go on an exciting adventure through of all places Nazi Germany. And how does that become conspiracy you ask? Let's go find out. For spinning I have various fibers here from spinning boxes I've gotten over time. They're all mystery fibers in some somewhat complementary colorways, so I'm just going to spin them all into a single and then I will chain ply. So this will be a nice simple spin as I tell you a story. So grab your coffee or your tea and your tin foil. You're going to need it. Got to protect that noggin. And let's spin a yarn. There's not much fun about Nazis and the experiments they conducted during World War II. They were hideous people with disgusting agendas that they conducted on living human beings. But out of all the darkness, there is a story of research that, if it's true, could blow apart the world of science as we know it. So let's talk about Die Glock, or the Nazi Bell. What was Die Glock? Well, truth is, we're not really sure. It could have been a centrifuge, a particle accelerator, a spaceship, or a time machine, or all of those things at once. Witnesses say the bell was so-called because of its shape. It was wide on the bottom and relatively narrow at the top, about 12 to 15 feet high and roughly nine feet wide. It was fabricated of extremely hard, heavy metal covered with a ceramic shell. It was powered by a mysterious liquid fuel called Serum 525. This was a thick red to maroon colored liquid that had similar properties to mercury and was shielded by a lead container when not in use. Some claim that this fluid was actually the mythical red mercury, which is a whole other topic. I'm not going to get into right now. We have enough places to go. The serum 525 was placed in the bell. Then the outer chamber and the inner chamber were rotated, one clockwise, one counterclockwise. This increased the power and the efficiency of the energy field generator. The effect from the device stretched up to 660 feet around the craft, where unexplainable things happened like the formation of crystals within animal tissue, the decomposition of plant matter into a greasy substance, and the gelling and separation of blood. It was also highly radioactive. Five of the seven members of the research team, led by Walther Gerlich, died during the tests. So this is a somewhat effective weapon, but compared to like a nuclear bomb, it's not terribly efficient. So why waste time experimenting with this particular device? Well, because apparently the device defied gravity. That's right, the holy grail of science, anti-gravity. And in defying gravity, apparently it could open a window to the past. During operation, you could watch the past like a movie on the mirrored surface of the bell. But wait, there's more. The bell was kept tethered by thick chains to, quote, the henge during operation, but apparently could travel to other planets. There are persistent theories that the Nazis had contact with non-human intelligences, aka aliens, that provided them with clues or direct knowledge of new technologies. These technologies led to the development of the planes and rockets we know that they made during World War II. Perhaps the bell was used to contact these intelligences. Okay, hold on. I can hear you. This is insanity. 
Where in heck did all this come from? Tales like this don't just appear. There has to be some evidence for it, doesn't there? Maybe. Let's look and see what we find. First of all, I want everyone to meet Igor Wykowski. He's a military journalist in Poland. He's an author of many professional articles and over 50 books on military technology and the history of World War II. He's been editor-in-chief of two military magazines and 22 of his books describe the history of the Third Reich as well as high-tech Nazi armament projects. In other words, he's what you would call an expert. Because of this, he's been able to acquire previously unknown documents, not just from the West, but from the East. Igor published a book called The Truth About the Wunderwaffe. Wunderwaffe means wonder weapons. What Nazi propaganda believed would win them the war. Here's the description of the book from Amazon. Quote, The Truth About the Wunderwaffe is about the Third Reich's weapon of last resort, but it is a book unlike any other on the subject. The author, a former military journalist, has done extensive research on three continents in the archives of many countries, and he has uncovered a wealth of facts about weapons and weapons systems unknown to the general public. This book is very well documented, and most of the sources have never before been presented in any publication. The main section is an analysis of a research project pertaining to a weapon that officially was, and still stands, beyond any normal classification. The Wunderwaffe, or according to German documents, a weapon decisive for war." End quote. Okay, so this sounds really exciting, right? Everything began in August 1992. This is how Iger begins his epic story of chasing leads, hunting down threads, and trying to find documents to explain what exactly this Wunderwaffe was. In the chaos following the fall of the Nazis, people, projects, and papers were lost, destroyed, or taken by the military powers in several countries, the USA and the USSR in particular, and silence was enforced ruthlessly. So it was many, many years before even hints of these captures came to light. Think of Operation Paperclip in the USA. Paperclip collected Nazi scientists to work in the States and further scientific research for the Americans. But it wasn't just the superpowers that were collecting people and information. In Poland, here we go. My German's a little better than my Japanese, but still. In Poland, an Obergruppenführer named Jacob Sporenberg was captured. So, Obergruppenführer, <laughs> I feel like I'm talking Klingon, was a rank in the SS only two steps down from Hitler himself. So this was indeed a powerful man in the know. And since he knew they would execute him when interrogations began, Sporenberg talked. And apparently he had a lot to say because the longer he provided information, the longer he would live. But eventually, in December 1952, he was brought to trial for war crimes. Most of the information he shared during interrogations was classified as top secret materials for special purposes and was therefore never shared during the trial. And of course, no surprise, Spornberg was sentenced to death for the act of genocide during the war in Poland. And that should be the end of the Spornberg chapter, but here's where things become very interesting. The day before the execution, all the persons that were obligated to observe it were changed, meaning none of the new persons had ever had dealings with Spornberg. So the fact that another man was executed under Sporenberg's name wasn't discovered. Sporenberg was phoned secretly to the USSR. Apparently expecting treachery, Sporenberg had informed his lawyer what was to transpire. And as late as the 1960s, Sporenberg's family was still petitioning for his release from the USSR. 
he likely didn't live much longer after he was transported there since the possibility of him escaping needed to be 100% impossible. So likely he was quickly <clears throat> interrogated and then executed in Russia. Shortly after his supposed execution, however, there was a flurry of deaths. Anyone who had participated in the interrogations began to die. Rudolf Schuster died suddenly in obscure circumstances. Colonel Zemansky was killed in a plane crash with a group of witnesses. His superior, Jacob Prawin, died when his boat capsized. And Major Walkznek, Walkaznek, oh, Russian I'm bad at, he was killed in a car crash. President Brut went on an official visit to Moscow where he suddenly became ill and died. Something Spornberg knew and shared had to be so explosive that no one could know what he had revealed in those interrogations. And Igor started to think maybe the rumors of the Nazi bell were true. He knew that to treat the matter seriously, he would need to do a fully independent study from sources outside the Polish hierarchy. And since there was a wave of archive destruction at the end of the 1980s, it wasn't even certain documents still existed. But Iger was a historian. This was like a grail quest for him. And he knew how to tackle it, even as he realistically predicted, it would take years of investigation and sources he had never used before. So he started by attempting to understand and explain the nature of the science behind the supposed anti-gravity generating Nazi bell. He made a list of the major characteristics of the bell. So they were the employment of high voltages, magnetic field separation, vortex compression, very powerful magnetic fields, the spinning of masses as a means to achieve these effects, powerful radiation, non-pulse operation, and transforming mercury to gold. This is a pretty lengthy list, but these were just the major things said about the bell. So a lot of this makes my brain hurt since I'm not a genius like my brother. But basically, I grew in questing for scientists who could substantiate these theories. And he found them. Dr. Krzysztof Godwood from the Institute of Theoretical Physics at the Polish Academy of Science, who led to Professor Marek Demianski, Dema, De, Demianski, Polish, I'm as bad at that as I am at Russian and Japanese. So Merrick, I can say Merrick, Merrick from the Institute of Theoretical Physics at the University of Warsaw. Then came Dr. Mariusz Paskowski, who was a phenomenal research scientist with the Polish Academy of Science. And he is really interesting. Do a dive on him if you're looking for something to branch out into on after this. He's an interesting guy. So with this think tank all working on the same theories of what the Nazi bell might do, they soon confirmed that in theory, it could indeed be an anti-gravitational device. So there are pages and pages and pages laying out the avenues that these scientists explored and how they use science to confirm the logistics of the bell. If you enjoy mind-torturing science, theoretical physics, then I strongly recommend you get a copy of Iger's book and read it for yourself. He prevents it all quite well. It's just a bit too complex for my little noggin. So Igor went back to trying to find documentation, documentation to support the existence of the bell. He researched Nazi facilities involved in research for weapons and stumbled across one that seemed to be different than the others. 
and an active coal mine adopted for military purposes in the vicinity of Waldenburg in Poland. Michael Banas from Krakow, in the employ of the Polish Academy of Sciences, was engaged in mine research in that area and had discovered a rather strange mine that had been used during the war, but he couldn't figure out exactly for what. Bennis established that an accident in 1931 had closed the mine, which was then taken over by the state. It seemed an explosives factory was established there during the war years, or at least that's what they said, but that didn't seem right either. The main shaft of the mine was in a valley accessed only by two mountain passes, both of which had the remnants of watchtowers, proving that the entire valley was closely guarded and by protecting those passes was physically cut off from the outside world. In the valley was a very developed infrastructure, typical for underground military facilities, not mines, kilometers of perfect roads, masses of bunkers, remnants of gates and fences. These all indicated an active underground military facility. All the reinforced buildings and bunkers were even camouflaged. That much effort wouldn't be made for a mine. Probably not even for an explosives factory. On an area of flat ground was a structure like no other. Twelve massive pillars, about 10 to 12 meters in height, arranged in a reinforced concrete ring with no roof or walls, plastered and painted with metal fixtures at the top. At first, People thought this was the base for a cooling tower for the pre-war power plant. But Bannis produced photos of where those cooling towers actually had been. And by taking measurements, he also showed how this structure was too short and would have to have had walls to be a cooling tower base. He dispelled that assumption. In fact, what the structure most closely resembled was the so-called flytrap, a test rig built by Avro, a Canadian aircraft research facility most well known for the ill-fated Arrow, which I'll cover at another time. Another crazy story. The flytrap was built for testing disc-shaped flying objects. So this was a very intriguing link. This structure at what became known as the Wenceslas, Wenceslas, Wenceslas <laughs> mine had cables as thick as a man's arm carrying high voltage electricity from the nearby power plant to this structure, the Henge. What could they possibly have been working on to need that much power? Digging deeper, our hero Igor was able to talk to former prisoners and even to the only living person to have had direct access to German documents. Professor, I cannot say his first name, Mike Zeisler Moldawa, um, Close enough, Moldawa. Professor Moldawa, I can say that. Professor Moldawa stated that for sure that that structure was not a cooling tower base. He also confirmed that research into weapons was carried out in the area and that there were many electrical engineers and mechanics employed there. You don't need them to build explosives. Bannis also established that the entire underground facility which has since flooded and is no longer accessible covered over 30 million square meters making it one of the largest mines in europe everything was pointing to this being the facility where the bell was tested it was theorized that the cables were attached to the bell to power it while the metal fixtures on the hinge 
were used to chain the bell and restrain it from flying away. So how to prove that the Germans produced and employed a revolutionary type of propulsion? Well, according to Igor, the proof has always been there. There are plentiful accounts of unmanned objects with radiation side effects beginning in the last weeks of November 1944. Allied pilots started to come in contact with a new phenomenon. Luminous, rounded, flying objects were sighted, which sometimes only shadowed the approaching aircraft and sometimes performed strange aerobatics. Anti-aircraft weapons were ineffective against them and radar ceased to work. The objects emitted strong electromagnetic energy that damaged some devices on board aircraft. And these objects shone with a very strong light, most often white. But they could be red, orange, or amber. And they were all generally smaller than an aircraft. Here's an account from the New York Times, quote, Yesterday, during a night air raid on Hamburg, a mysterious luminous ball appeared near an Allied bomber squadron, which despite many attacks of escorting fighters, appeared to be indestructible. This mysterious and undoubtedly Hitler's new weapon very effectively jammed all radio communication None of our experts managed to explain, as previously, what the principle of operation of the luminous balls was based on and through which tremendous speeds demonstrated maneuverability at variance with the laws of aerodynamics, end quote. So basically, they were really fast and shouldn't be able to move that way. The language is a little difficult. It's from 1944. Then we have a quote from the British daily paper, the South Wales argue, quote, the Germans have produced for Christmas their new secret weapon. It is clearly an anti-aircraft weapon and resembles glass balls with which one decorates Christmas trees at Christmas. They were observed over German territory, sometimes in groups, end quote. Now, Let's bring this all together with this article published on January 2nd, 1945 by the New York Tribune. Quote, the Germans have thrown something new into the night skies over Germany. The weird, mysterious Foo Fighter. Balls of fire that race alongside the wings of American bow fighters flying intruder missions over the Reich. American pilots have been encountered, encountering the Erie Foo Fighters for more than a month in their night flights. No one apparently knows exactly what this sky weapon is. The balls of fire appear suddenly and accompany the plane for miles. They appear to be radio controlled from the ground and keep up with planes flying. End quote. Yep, the Nazi bell was the mysterious Foo Fighters. Not the band, of course, but the original aerial phenomenon encountered by pilots in 1944 and 45. And if you didn't know, that's where the band Foo Fighters got their name from. So, before we dismiss this out of hand, let's look at what the Germans would have needed to build a fleet of Dagelk. One ingredient that strangely kept popping up was mercury. It was known that there was a connection between Japan and Germany during the war, that they worked together. But due to the huge distances and the enemy troops in between, transporting materials was mostly done by submarine. Now, subs in those days were really small and had very limited storage capacities. Even the fuel capacity was rationed and treated as if it was as precious as gold. So imagine the shock when in 1972, sunken submarine U-859's cargo was retrieved and it carried 33 tons of mercury. What? That's a lot 
of that little sub's cargo space taken up with mercury. The British Discovery Channel had a documentary devoted to the Japanese submarine I-52, which was sunk in 1944. It had received strategic materials from U-530, a Nazi sub, that had been transferred at open sea. And it also included a large amount of, yep, mercury. So now they're making clandestine supply drops between the Germans and the Japanese, and it includes mercury. There is even a book that tells of Hitler's hidden storehouses, and they contain huge amounts of mercury along with gold. So obviously the mercury was seen as precious as gold. At the end of the war, U-boat 234 surrendered to the Americans in May of 1945. Its entire cargo was intact and it contained a whopping 24,112 kilograms of mercury. And of course the crew said they had no idea why they carried that much mercury. But if the bell required mercury and the Foo Fighters were encountered over Germany and Japan, it seems to follow that the bell was in both countries. But if the bell existed, what happened to it after the war? Well, hold on to your butts. Here's where things get even more shadowy and complicated. Thanks to the X-Files, most have heard of Operation Paperclip, where the Americans took Nazi technology and scientists and brought them to the States to work there. These were men who did leading edge research, often at the expense of innocence, and they were given a second life because of their brains. I'm not gonna get into the ethics of it because it's an irrelevant argument. It happened, it's done, and there's nothing we can do to change it. We can just avoid doing such stupid things in the future. So 127 engineers, scientists, and technicians came to the US. The majority of them had been involved with the V2 rocket program, which was the first kind of intercontinental missile. These men were known as the Von Braun Group. They were named for Wernher Von Braun, who eventually became the NASA Engineering Program Manager and was the chief architect of the Apollo Saturn V rocket, something that's very famous. Strange that a Nazi ended up in a position of such power. What did he bring to the States to accomplish this besides his tremendous brain? Could he have brought knowledge of the bell? Or maybe even the bell itself? Wait, 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 wait. The bell in the United States. Not possible. There's no talk of Foo Fighters in the States, so it couldn't have been in the States. Could it? On December 9th, 1965, around 4.47 p.m., a flaming object streaked over Canada, Ohio, and western Pennsylvania. It appeared to be guided, changing its course and making a level descent away from the residential areas and into the woods of Kecksburg. The object was later described as a large metal bell-like structure with Egyptian hieroglyph-like markings etched into it. It was about eight feet long and was in the shape of an acorn. Neven and Nadine Kelp were playing in their yard when the object flew overhead and crashed into a ravine. The sibling's mother, Frances, called into the local radio station to say that the object appeared to be part of an airplane, not a full airplane, as the broadcast claimed. A few minutes later, Francis got a call from the U.S. Navy and was told to watch around the area of the crash. State troopers and two unidentified men soon arrived and Francis told them where the crash site was located. Search teams were called in to locate the actual crash site. Volunteer fireman Jim Mays, leading one team of state troopers, located the site from an overlook above a ravine. 
Jim noticed several blue flashing lights coming from the area. So 30 volunteer firemen went down and started searching the ravine. James Roman Romanski, we're in the States now and I'm still getting Polish names, go figure. James Romanski was part of this team and they located the actual object. He said it was partly buried in the ground, that it was made of metal between 10 and 12 feet long and generally shaped like an acorn. There were strange markings on a band near the bottom that resembled hieroglyphics. He did not believe that the object was an aircraft. Shortly after that, the men were ordered off the site by the military who had arrived at the remote crash site within an hour. The site was cordoned off and all of the civilians were refused entry. James Hayes, James? I'm hung up on James and Jimmy's now. John Hayes was 10. And while he didn't see the crash, he came home to a flurry of excitement. He said, quote, when I went in the house, my dad had the radio on and they said something crashed in Acme. Then mom was looking out the window and said, it's not an Acme, it's right out there. Look at all the cars out across the hill. There was activity all over the place, end quote. John got to see the military man up close and personal. They set up their command post in his family's two-story house overlooking the ravine. The site offered them a view of the area as well as a working telephone. John tells the story of that night. Quote, the first thing they did was tell my parents to send us kids to bed. Well, naturally I was excited by all the goings on and our bathroom was downstairs. I made quite a few trips to the bathroom that night. There were a lot of men in uniforms and there were some men in suits, and it was clear that the men in suits were in charge of everything. They were over top of the military, and they had a lot of clout. I couldn't see down into the hollow where they were at, but I did see six guys in radio, radiation suits take a box down there. I didn't see them bring it back out. End quote. He said a later inspection of the family's phone bill showed no evidence of the calls that were made by the men in the house that night. Some witnesses said the authorities warned them away from the area because of a risk of radiation from the object. Others were just ordered to leave at gunpoint. So they did. What struck the residents of Texburg and investigators to this day for that matter was how quickly armed military men, more than two dozen of them, arrived at the scene, taking charge and chasing people away. Meanwhile, back at the fire station in town, James Romanski and the others were locked out of their own fire station by the military, who were using it as an emergency post. James says he saw a covered object on a flatbed truck taken away, an object that he believes was a UFO from the crash site. John also believes that he saw the mysterious object leaving in a military convoy. No one knows where the object went to afterwards. When Unsolved Mysteries did a segment on the crash, they had created a mock-up of the craft, which is now displayed outside the fire hall. Here's the object that crashed outside Kecksburg. And here's a picture of the Nazi bell. Coincidence? Ancient astronaut theorists think not. In fact, ancient aliens did an episode claiming the Kecksburg crash was indeed the Nazi bell. Kind of scares me that I saw this connection like they did. I'm so not an ancient astronaut theorist. Maybe I am, and I just don't want to admit it. But I'm going to look elsewhere. There is this SS official named Hans, Hans Kammler, who ran the Nazi secret V2 rocket program. Now, Kammler was a grade A asshole. 
He used slave labor from the concentration camps and was so ruthlessly brutal with them that 10,000 people died producing the V-2 rockets alone. Kamler's attitude towards the prisoner was utter indifference. He once said, quote, Don't worry about the victims. The work must proceed ahead in the shortest time possible. End quote. So in other words, the ends justify the means. In late March 1945, Kamler ordered the execution of 200 men, women, and children after his car was delayed on a crowded road in Sauerland. He claimed he felt he was under a vague threat and that the riffraff needed to be eliminated. He was absolutely without regard for any human life but his own and his Führer's, although even Hitler was likely secondary. As the Reich was falling, Kamler's whereabouts became confused. In fact, he's reported killed in about five different ways in about five different places, but none of these are confirmed. In fact, he seemed to disappear completely along with the bell. It's theorized that he traded the bell and related technology to the U.S. in return for his freedom. Or that he was captured by the Americans and was enhancedly interrogated, tortured, into revealing the secrets of the bell. Either way, this puts the bell in American hands which of course could lead to the Kecksburgs crash when they were test flying the bell and lost control and it crashed and then they zipped in, scooped it up and took it back to secrecy. But I have one more theory I'd like to put forth. There is talk that the bell was used to travel to other worlds. Perhaps Kamler boarded the bell to escape prosecution and spent years on another planet before attempting to return to Earth, dying in the crash at Kecksburg. The military was nearby because he told them he was coming and they were to take him into protective custody. Or maybe he survived the crash and was taken by the military only to be executed after interrogation. Wait a second. Okay, maybe I am an ancient alien theorist after all. But let me know what you think. Do you even think that the Nazi bell was a thing? If you do want to impress the kids, though, ask them what they know about the Nazi bell that appears in the popular video game Call of Duty. Or maybe they read about it in James Rollins' novel Black Order. Or saw it in the TV series 12 Monkeys, Hangar 1, or the Tesla Files. They'd be wowed to know that you actually have knowledge. I hope you enjoyed a good yarn. Let me know your theories. I'm very curious. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time.